I don't know, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 times. It's got 300 years to be changed. By the time it finally gets into the council, these people are no more aware of the changes than you were. Why didn't you turn in the DNA from the Terry Lynn Hollis case to the crime lab in the period from 1994 to 1999 if you were working as a cold case detective? Are there any other cold cases besides the Terry Lynn Hollis case that you opened prior to DA John Lewin assigning this work in the late 1990s? If you answered yes to question two, can you name that case or cases? If the Terry Lynn Hollis case is the only cold case that you worked on prior to being assigned cold cases by DA John Lewin in the late 1990s, is it your contention that doing a forensic statement analysis on the false confession of Ronald Paul Kozak qualifies you to be considered an experienced cold case detective? If Cameron Bertuzzi's claim is truthful that you told him that your father was not involved in the Ronald Paul Kozak interview, why do you always refer to the Terry Lynn Hollis case as, quote, your father's case? If your father wasn't involved in the interview of Ronald Paul Kozak, and since you were a child at the time of his his arrest, why did Cameron Bertuzzi claim that you told him that you knew factually that the confession was not coerced? Since you've stated that the detectives fed Ronald Paul Kozak information that only the killer would know about and that they essentially bungled the case, why isn't the inference that his confession was coerced at least a very likely possibility. What other reason besides malfeasance are you suggesting as to why the police gave Ronald Paul Kozak information that only the killer would know about during their interrogation? Knowing that the DA didn't pursue Ronald Paul Kozak due to exculpatory evidence, why did you try to prove he was in fact guilty with a forensic statement analysis? Assuming Cameron's claim is correct that you told him your father thought Ron Paul Kozak was innocent, why did you pursue the forensic statement analysis to try to prove him guilty, especially in light of the fact that exculpatory evidence existed that proved he was innocent? Were you as a police officer in the habit of trying to prove innocent men guilty. If you now claim that you didn't know of the exculpatory evidence in the Ronald Paul Kozak case, wouldn't that also prove you weren't a cold case detective? Because certainly a real cold case detective would have inventoried a case they were working on, correct? Isn't inventorying the evidence the very first step in working a cold case? Isn't inventorying the evidence the first assignment DA John Lewin assigned to you and two other detectives as the very first step in choosing what cases to pursue in the late 1990s? Did you inventory the Terry Lynn Hollis case prior to converting to Christianity? If you did not inventory the Terry Lynn Hollis case, doesn't this mean you are not functioning as a legitimate cold case detective? If you were to now claim you did inventory the Terry Lynn Hollis case prior to becoming a Christian, that would mean you would have to have had a very good reason for not turning the DNA over to the crime lab. Until the year 2000 is stated on Dateline. If this is the case, what is that good reason? If you don't have a valid reason for failing to turn in the DNA to the crime lab, in a case you're claiming you were actually working as a cold case detective, wouldn't that mean you were in fact negligent and irresponsible? If you're claiming that you were not negligent and irresponsible, doesn't that mean you must finally admit that you were in fact not working as a cold case detective in the period prior to converting to Christianity? Why do you continue to allow Christian apologists to falsely claim you are a homicide detective before converting to Christianity? Why do you allow Greg Kokel to claim you found the killers in the cold cases you worked on when John Lewis has claimed that in every single case they brought to court due to your work, 
The killer was already identified prior to opening the cold case files. You've claimed, and it's been said about you, that your skill set in these cold cases was tied to your creative abilities and your organizational work with the evidence. Since every case had a killer already identified and your work was with previously gathered evidence, making court appearances and appearing on television shows, in what way did this work qualify you to be called a famous and sought-after cold case detective? Isn't it true that your fame was tied to your celebrity status as a true crime television cop and that it had nothing to do with any special detective skills that you possessed? Don't the false statements about your experience and positions held as a police officer, such as being in homicide before your conversion and the insinuation that you were a world-famous cold case detective based on your skill set and not your celebrity status from television appearances, undercut any idea that Christian apologists care about carefully vetting the truth and representing reality in truthful ways? Doesn't the fact that your legend as a world-famous and highly skilled cold case detective, which by your own testimony was based on your celebrity status rather than your skills, prove in this day and age of video and audio recording that the skeptic theory that the stories about Jesus show legendary development in an age without video or audio recordings, newspapers or magazines is valid? Since Christians and Christian apologists continue to embellish your story unchecked by you or even other Christians, doesn't that prove that the idea that early Christians would check the legends about Jesus a very spurious one? Bitch! Since we have video and audio proof that you've allowed others to lie on your behalf about your skills and position, doesn't that prove that Christians are willing to let legendary development continue unchecked? Do you think Christians today are just untrustworthy, but that the early Christians in an age of superstition were totally honest and all about fact-checking legendary stories about men they admired, such as Jesus, Paul and the Apostles. Is it your allegation that when apologists like Kirk Cameron explicitly lie about your experience, reading these lies, such as, quote, you were a homicide detective, off of cue cards, that Kirk Cameron's team was totally responsible and you gave the showrunners no accurate information before recording the interview? Why would you not correct the false impressions that Christian apologists continue to give about your experience and set the record straight? Do you have the personal integrity and commitment to being truthful even if it costs you money and credibility? You've stated that you left the institutional church after reading the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament and that you formed a home church. Do you have a neutral board of directors to ensure that your finances are in order? Do you tithe to yourself? Does your home church have a staff? Is it open to the public without regard to race or sexual orientation? When you stated on a Focus on the Family broadcast that you and your wife were asked to be Sunday school teachers and you answered that you were new Christians and didn't know anything yet, doesn't that undercut your backstory that you'd spent many months deeply investigating Christianity's claims and that you became a Christian based on the evidence and not emotional reasons. Are you willing to discuss why you had a fallout with Rick Warren and have refused since the early days to mention his name in your talks about your first introduction to the Jesus is the smartest human ever preaching that you experienced at Saddleback Church? You've claimed you hated God and that God had to remove the enmity that you had for God before you could believe. How does this hatred of God square with your avowed and committed atheism? If you believe in the biblical principle of avoiding evil, including the appearance of evil, and believe in integrity and ethics, why aren't you willing to be interviewed by a skeptic? What, if any, support do you have that Forensic statement analysis or any kind of statement analysis works for analyzing ancient documents such as the Gospels or the Book of Acts.
You've repeatedly stated that identical testimony proves cooperation and isn't any good as independent evidence. Doesn't that mean, if you're consistent, that the synoptic gospels cannot be counted as more than a single source? A large number of scholars with years of study in New Testament and history, including conservative Christians, believe the changes in the Gospel of John are due to literary devices and conventions. With what applicable training do you dismiss these scholars? When Greg Kokel, a man you've described as a friend, repeatedly misrepresents your experience, does he know that he's lying, or has he been misled by you or your staff? Was Sean McDowell's description of you accurate when he said, Now what I love about you is that you don't approach this as an academic who's read books. You've stated in interviews that you don't trust experts and that someone having letters after their name doesn't matter to you. Wouldn't it be equally valid, if not more so, to completely dismiss you and your work? Roll me further, bitch.